When I was 12 years old, I began to map out my life. Tucked in bed at night, I would write in my journal the number of children I would have, five, the name of my first son, Atreyu. <laughs> I think that came from a popular 80s movie. And my job, pediatrician. It was an idyllic existence. I belonged to an all-American family, the daughter to a stay-at-home mom and a physician dad, the younger sister to a handsome brother living in eastern North Carolina. When I was 14, my big brother Adam was diagnosed with cancer. Though we were nearly five years apart and squabbled like most siblings, I had always considered him my best friend. He was the one who taught me to apologize, even when it wasn't my fault. He was the one who offered the better bedroom when he headed off to college. He was the one who asked me about boys and told me never to settle. A year after his diagnosis, I marched up the hollow stairwell of our small town hospital and I said goodbye to the person I love most on this earth. Adam, my only sibling, strong and mighty to me, couldn't outsmart cancer. It was the first time I faced the unexpected. I was just a child. And to make sense of life's betrayal, I decided life must dole out one terrible thing per person. Thank goodness mine was out of the way. For the next 25 years, I buried grief for my brother and carried on with those plans I'd begun making at 12. I met the boy I was going to marry in college. Like my brother had instructed, I didn't settle when I said yes to Thomas Wood. When he finished law school, we moved to Edenton, North Carolina. I finished my PhD. We had four children. No, actually, we had three children <laughs> in four years. Two sons, Thomas and Russell, and a daughter, Blair. They look nice. <laughs> <laughs> when my oldest son, Thomas, started kindergarten, I became PTA president. Damn it, I was already a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> How's that for a perfect life? As a side note, I'm perfectly aware Sunday school teachers are not supposed to curse. <laughs> In the midst of round two of my perfect life, our fourth child was born, Amos, whose arrival was a surprise, came via C-section, my first, in a cold, unexpected November snow. Within minutes of his birth, our doctor was, was using big words to describe our new son. A sacral dimple, hypospadias, exotropia, all fixable issues. It wasn't until he was two weeks old that I began to worry. Unlike his brothers and sister at that age, he hadn't smiled. I watched, waited, held my breath. Finally, when he was 10 weeks old, he smiled. I was flooded with relief. He would be just fine after all. But he wasn't. We spent his first summer at the beach, and though our neighbor's daughter gnawed on peaches and splashed in tidal pools, Amos lay contentedly in his bouncy seat, interested only in his bottle and our dog, Clark. Though several surgeries had fixed parts of him, our questions grew. Why isn't he sitting up? 
Why doesn't he wave bye-bye? Why can't he babble? When he was 10 months old, I asked our pediatrician to make a referral for early intervention. On the day of the visit, our living room was nice and tidy. Amos was lying on a blanket on the floor. The early intervention coordinator asked innocently, what can he do? Is that all he can do? I had been alone in my fear, told that he would catch up. Here was a professional whose words mirrored my own thoughts. My perfect life had ended again. I began to swallow the fear and pain associated with the unexpected. It had worked, at least I thought, when my brother had died. I shoved those hard feelings aside and carried on. It wasn't until Amos was three years old that I heard the word autism. Autism, terribly real and unexpected, reintroduced me to my old friend grief, my old enemy grief. I thought grief only traveled with things that were fatal. Terrible car accidents, deadly fires, cancer. I had no idea it was possible to grieve a diagnosis that didn't end in a funeral. I knew nothing about autism or special needs parenting. Hell, parenting on its own is nothing short of heroic. <laughs> Before Amos, I only rated myself a, a C plus. Okay, maybe a D. Um, <laughs> this week, my children told me my favorite activity is to drink slushies and watch Dateline. <laughs> now I had to figure out how to parent autism. I was drowning in the what ifs. What if Amos is always disabled? What if Amos can never live alone? What if I can't handle all that comes with raising a child whose needs are extraordinary? Rather than be silenced by the what ifs, I decided to share the what is. The decision came late one night. I was awake, worrying about the son of mine, meant I couldn't sleep. As I pondered what I would do, this voice whispered, you used to write. I did. I had always been a writer. When my brother was sick, he kept a journal. When he could no longer write or speak, I kept it for him. On the day he died, I shut that yellow notebook. For the next 25 years, it gathered dust. But that night, I found it on the shelf of my closet. I wrote about the grief for my brother. I wrote about the fear regarding my fourth child. I wrote about a life that looks more like a rummage sale than a photo shoot. I've been writing and sharing the ins and outs of my life for three years. Before Amos, if you had told me that being a special needs parent was the most magical thing on earth, I would have politely smiled and called you a liar. <laughs> Not allowed, of course. My parents had raised me as a proper southerner. <laughs> but I would have been thinking it. Before Amos, I saw families like my own and felt a mixture of awe and pity. Before Amos, I thought special was just a nice way to say something awful. 
Instead, I've learned that our greatest gifts actually come from the unexpected parts of life. Sharing the what is has taught me about real love. Amos is six years old now. I wish I could tell you that this journey has been easy. It hasn't. I wish I could tell you that I wouldn't change a thing. I would. I wish I could tell you that autism and special needs are only given to the most special of families. It ain't true. What I can tell you is that before him, I didn't know a love like this existed. Motherhood is even more amazing when you have a baby bird that plummets rather than flies. Sharing the what is has taught my children that perfection doesn't mean you have to be like everyone else. They love and adore their younger brother. They have known nothing but a life of embracing the unexpected. They are wired with an amazing level of compassion and empathy because they love someone who's different. I remember a conversation I had with my daughter a few years ago. When are you going to potty train Amos? I don't think he's ready. He's only three. Maybe when he's four? I don't know. What if he never gets potty trained? People might make fun of him, and what if I'm at school and can't make them shut up? Good point. Maybe there's something we could teach him that he's ready to learn right now. Sharing the what is has uncloaked the joy I believed was lost with my brother. At 12 years old, I dreamt of motherhood and a perfect existence. But in reality, my life looks like this. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I see myself and my daughter trying to look nice, Drinking a beer. <laughs> Wondering why I had so many kids. <laughs> I am knee deep in living a wonderfully imperfect life. A life that doesn't much resemble that 12-year-old girl's script. I've stopped concerning myself with having perfect children. I've given up on a meticulous house. I've grown amazingly adept at stepping over piles of laundry for family movies. Think of a world where perfection is kicked to the curb. It doesn't matter if your kids are road scholars or don't know to stay out of the road. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're single, married, or divorced. It doesn't matter what job you have, how much money you make, or how much you weigh. 154. <laughs> okay, I'm lying, 162. <laughs> Lay down that semblance of order that we tend to present to the world on a silver platter and bring out the Tupperware. Offer the real version, the unexpected one, the truthful one, the one that involves marriage and yelling, do not put your deodorant on your sister's face. 
exhaustion, autism, maybe even fear. The life I plotted and planned doesn't touch the beautiful of the life I've been gifted. A few years ago, we were making plans for almost three-year-old Amos to join the special needs classroom at our elementary school. My husband and I shared the news with them at the dinner table. Our younger two children were immediately excited, but our oldest son, almost 10, got up and quietly left the table. A few minutes later, I rose to look for him. There he was, curled up on the couch in my husband's study. He was crying. Why can't Amos go to normal preschool? I just want him to be like everybody else. I know. I don't want him to have special needs. If you could trade him for another brother, would you? I was unsure of his answer. Well, no, I've gotten used to him. Me too. Mine's not the life I mapped out for myself or would have chosen. What I have chosen is to share this life. And no one has taught me to embrace the unexpected more than a little boy named Amos. <laughs> missed you. <laughs> okay, say thank you. Thank you.